Good evening from the Hub Robeson Center on the University Park campus of Penn State University. Tonight in Heritage Hall, a Penn State Town Hall Forum. Tonight's forum is designed to be an open discussion between students and administrators seeking to move forward and ensure transparency in the wake of the Jerry Sandusky child sexual abuse scandal, which has rocked Penn State. Where do we go from here? Penn State students will pose that question to newly appointed Penn State President Rodney Erickson and seven senior administrators. The moderators for this event are Penn State sociologists Sam Richards and Lori Mulvey, the husband and wife team known for their popular World in Conversation project, which challenges students to talk candidly about their beliefs and attitudes on a wide range of social issues. The national press has been invited to tonight's forum. However, questions will come exclusively from Penn State students here in Heritage Hall and those viewing from locations set up at Commonwealth campuses. T.J. Bard, president of Penn State's University Park Undergraduate Association, and Peter Corey, president of the Council of Commonwealth Student Government, will open tonight's Penn State Town Hall Forum. Good evening, and welcome to Penn State's first ever Student Town Hall Forum. My name is T.J. Bard, and I'm the president of the University Park Undergraduate Association. I'm joined here tonight with my colleagues Peter Corey, who serves as the president of the Council of Commonwealth Student Governments, as well as John Lozano, the president of the Graduate Student Association. Tonight's event is the very first of its kind in the history of our university. Peter, John, and I are honored and excited to be welcoming all of you here, as well as those streaming in from our Commonwealth campuses across the state of Pennsylvania. I would also like to especially thank President Rodney Erickson, and the senior vice presidents who are here tonight. We are looking forward to an open, responsible, and professional conversation amongst our Penn State community. Tonight's Student Town Hall Forum is intended to give you the opportunity to engage key university decision makers about the future of Penn State. Sharing your thoughts, feelings, and opinions as students is essential to this community's well-being. We know that you still have many questions, and we hope that this forum will help you find answers. Our hearts go out to everyone affected by recent events. Now, please join me in welcoming the 17th president of the Pennsylvania State University, President Rodney Erickson. Well, thank you very much, Peter and TJ for those uh, opening remarks. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of you for coming this evening and for those who are uh, joining us uh, across the Commonwealth from other locations. This is a terrific turnout and I'm, I'm really delighted to see you all here and have this opportunity to, to interact with you. I know all of us uh, shared in the shock and sadness when we read the Attorney General's presentment uh, now almost four weeks ago and our hearts continue to go out to the victims of this tragedy. But I'm also very proud of the way that our students and other members of the Penn State community have responded. Our students responded with a candlelight vigil, with a whole so host of other activities to raise funds for the victims and to show the caring and community that I have come to know as Penn State over the past 34 and a half years that I've been here. This is a difficult time for us, but it's a time to look forward and not look backward, uh, continuing. When I took this uh, position, I told the trustees and those who were listening that I really wanted to spend a lot of time doing several things over the next few weeks. One of them was to listen. One of them was to hear from students, from faculty, from staff, from alumni, and others around the country who were interested in learning more about Penn State, but also telling me what was on their mind. I also said that I wanted to reassure members of the Penn State community that we will not let the actions of any individual define who we are as a university and a community. 
I've said that I wanted to reaffirm that Penn State continues to have a very bright future despite what's happened. And I said I wanted to have core values with as many of you, I wanted to have discussions with as many of you as possible about our core values. Our values of honesty, integrity, excellence, and community, among others. So that's what we're really here for tonight, is to talk about all of these kinds of issues, talk about going forward, how we go forward to learn from where we've been, but to be a better university, a stronger university going forward. And we will do that, you have my promise. Many of you have met, the, met uh, uh, have uh, listened rather to the, uh, and read the five promises that I have made. Uh, I have said that we would raise the vis visibility of ethics in the university. Uh, we will raise it to a new level so that hopefully everyone in the university understands not necessarily just the legal thing to do, but the moral thing to do so that we learn to do the right thing the first time every time. I've also said that we will create a spirit of transparency and openness of the, at the university. And I hope you've been reading many of my recent messages that hopefully have kept you up to date about initiatives that we're rolling out and things that are happening at Penn State. I've also said that we will remember the victims. And I pledge to you that we will continue to do that, not just the victims of these alleged events, but also victims of childhood sexual abuse in all of its dimensions in the much wider context of the national arena. I've also promised that we will cooperate fully and completely with the Special Investigations Task Force that's been formed by the Board of Trustees. We will provide open, honest, complete access to any information that Judge Free needs in the context of that investigation. I have also promised that we will look at many aspects of the university in terms of governance and oversight. And we will ensure that there is appropriate oversight over all aspects of the university, including intercollegiate athletics. So we're here tonight to have a discussion, and I thank you again for coming, and I want to introduce my, my colleagues here uh, who are to my left, and I will introduce them so you can direct questions to them uh, as may be appropriate to the particular part of the university in which they uh, uh, largely function. Uh, starting uh, on your left is Dr. Rob Pangborn. Rob is the Vice President and Dean for Undergraduate and currently serves as Acting Executive Vice President and Provost of the University. Next is Damon Sims. Damon is the Vice President for Student Affairs. Next is Madeline Haynes. Madeline is the Vice President for Commonwealth Campuses. The next is Hank Foley, who is the Vice President and Dean for Graduate Education. Next is Craig Weideman, Vice President for Outreach. The next is the other Rod, Rod Kirsch, who is the Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations. And next to Rod is Terrell Jones, the Vice Provost for Educational Equity. So we're here to answer your questions this evening. And now we'll uh, turn it back to the questioners. Thank you. Thank you so very much, President Erickson. Please turn your attention to the programs you have with you tonight. On the back, you'll find the panelists' names and titles, as well as a seating diagram at the bottom. Now, I would like to welcome our moderators for tonight's forum, Sam Richards and Lori Mulvey, who will go over some brief ground rules before we get started. Sam and Lori. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here. Um, yes, we're in the middle of a crisis, but as a lot of you also know, that means we're in the midst of an opportunity. And to see so many faces here is really an opportunity. I'm really grateful and thankful to the student leaders for imagining this forum for us and convening it. It's been a very impressive process to, to be a part of. Uh, I, I'd just like to say that I think this is a small step forward. There are many steps forward that, that we're taking as a community. Uh, but this step is just going to be simply talking to one another. 
and there's a lot of power in that, in that talking to one another. And so in that process, we hope to begin to rebuild some relationships and build some new relationships. So the way we want to see this evening is sort of simulating a conversation. And there's a lot of people here to make this a conversation, but on some level we want to try to simulate a conversation. So we have a couple guidelines to try to help us to do that, and Sam's going to share those. And, and most of the guidelines apply not only to those of us out here in the, on the floor, but also um, those of us here on the panel. Um, the first thing is raise your hands when you have a question, and we will get to you. There are a lot of people here with a lot of questions, so we're going to try to limit it to one question and one comment per person. And we want to try to, as best as possible, keep some of the questions um, in, in, in group them together. So if you have a follow-up to something that somebody says, an immediate follow-up, um, let us know. Intervene and grab us, and we'll try to get, get to you as quickly as possible. And, and we're, we're going to ask you to stand when you ask your question, just so you're more visible. Um, and use the it. microphone. And that's it. Otherwise, it is a conversation. Okay, so, so who's got the first questions. question? Hello. Maybe you could state your name. Okay. Before My you name is Ricky Morales. And we'd like to thank everyone here for taking the time this evening to speak with us. This is an incredible first step in starting a real, honest dialogue with students. And we hope to have more student forums like this one in the future. So. President Erickson, you wrote that Penn State is committed to transparency to the fullest extent possible given the ongoing investigations. However, many students feel that transparency should encompass more than just the scandal. So that said, what does transparency mean to you? Can you think of any specific ways, not just related to the scandal, that transparency has failed in the past at our university? And how does this new administration plan to handle those, these issues and improve upon how it was handled previously? Thank you. I think you uh, can see evidence of the transparency, uh, the fact that we're here this evening. Uh, this is, uh, is one of many steps uh, that we will be taking. And uh, next week, next uh, Tuesday, I'll be meeting with the Faculty Senate in an op open kind of forum uh, where I, I will uh, make a short presentation and stand for questions. There will be a forensic session following that. I'll be meeting with staff, and we're talking about uh, a wide range of issues, really. Uh, as individuals have uh, questions or comments that, uh, that they want to bring to my attention about particular issues, uh, my door is, uh, is open, my email is open, uh, as certainly can be attested to by the, uh, the more than 3,000 email messages I've received in the last three weeks. Uh, and I will uh, do my absolute best to, uh, to get back to you uh, with comments and, uh, and with uh, reasons why certain things are done. And I know I can speak for my colleagues uh, here who are on the stage as well, that we commit to that kind of uh, openness as well. Uh, we, uh, we will do whatever we can, as I've said, to uh, uh, promote transparency throughout the, uh, the course of not just the next uh, few months ahead with the uh, the several investigations that are that are going on, uh, but certainly uh, any other aspects uh, as well. Uh, students uh, should free, feel free, either individually uh, or uh, as uh, as groups of students, to uh, approach uh, me or any other members of, of the administration. And that's a commitment that I that I make to you. Okay. We have a question here. Hello, my name is Miles Blard, and I am Penn State. Um, I would like to thank you guys for having this open student forum um, and receiving questions from students and answering them. In 2007, Graham Spanier testified in front of the Pennsylvania State uh, Congress to defend Penn State's immunity from the Right to Know Act, which allows for Penn State to disclose no information to its students or the university, uh, sorry, to its, okay, sorry, which allows for Penn State to disclose no information to its students or the public concerning budget information, university decisions and procedures, as well as communications between university officials and Jerry Sandusky, among other things. Do you believe Penn State should revoke its immunity to the Right to Know Act based on President Erickson's and the university's promise of communication and transparency? Well, let, let me respond to the, uh, the first premise there that there isn't a lot of information already available. Um, 
all of you should know that, uh, that the university's budget is very open. Uh, some of you, I hope, have any of you gone to the, uh, the home page? Okay. Uh, if you go to the home page and, uh, and you click on about Penn State and the next click is the budget, there is uh, a tremendous amount of information there. You can go into your individual program and you can see exactly how they've spent their money. Uh, what they've spent on office supplies and what they've spent on travel and what they've spent on salaries and benefits and all sorts of other things. The only thing that you can't find there is uh, the individual salaries of, uh, of, or wages of, of faculty or staff who are employed by the university. But there's a tremendous amount of information there. There's also information on the university's financials uh, in terms of its balance sheet. There are just there, perhaps there's too much information. I've, I've asked uh, our uh, director of the, uh, the university budget office to actually go in and create, uh, I've called it a primer, but it's really uh, a, an instruction sheet on how to navigate the budget so that when individuals go into the university's budget, they can understand what's the difference between general funds or educational in general or restricted funds. Once you know some of those basic ground rules going into the budget, you can learn just about everything that there is to know in terms of the finances of the university. So there is a lot of information out there already. I think one of the keys is to make that information more accessible to more people so that you can understand what's really there. Um, Certainly, there's, uh, there's discussion that's taking place uh, uh, in uh, Harrisburg these days and around the Commonwealth about uh, uh, the right to know and, uh, and so forth. Um, but I, I have to, to tell uh, here that uh, right to know doesn't mean right to know everything because there will still be things that people won't get to know. For example, uh, you've all heard of or probably even signed when you go to the doctor the, uh, the statement about HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, medical records of people will not be open. Uh, student records will not be open and so forth. So uh, individuals should understand that, that even under right to know, there are certain restrictions about things that are legally mandated that we have no uh, ability to, uh, to, to subvent. So uh, overall, I think this, this context is, is changing. We'll certainly have to, uh, to see what kind of discussions take place in Harrisburg. We will obviously comply with uh, whatever decisions are, are made uh, and, and hope that uh, there's a, a reasonable uh, kind of uh, protection of sensitive sorts of information from those that the public really should be knowing. Okay, we want to bring some other uh, folks in on the panel. So why don't we go to the question that you have from the Commonwealth campus, if you could read that. This is from Brandywine, uh, and a student is named Chris Kramer. His question is, what can we as students do specifically to help out the victims? Who would like to take that? And the emphasis in that question, by the way, is on specifically. Okay. I think there's a lot of so there's a lot of opportunities for students in uh, from service learning to volunteerism to applied research to uh, to uh, uh, volunteering with organizations. Penn State has a rich history in providing support to individuals across the Commonwealth in the areas of childhood abuse. 4-H has about 2,000, 200,000 students, excuse me, that live across the Commonwealth, and there's a tremendous need for um, students to be mentors to help them deal with specific issues. We also have specific programs that are helping build, re build uh, resilient families that are dealing with difficult issues. So there are opportunities that we've been involved with for many, many years for you to participate that you can help individuals and have an impact. Does anybody else want to share something? Yeah, I'd like to add, and this doesn't apply specifically to the victims here at Penn State, but more generally to the issues of child abuse uh, we've been working hard over the last several weeks to do a very complete inventory of the curricula, the curricular offerings that uh, deal with these kinds of issues. Many of you will be going into careers and professions which bring you uh, into 
an environment where you need to understand the, the warning signals, you need to uh, be able to, you need to understand the kinds of reporting requirements uh, <coughs> associated with your particular kind of profession, um, and you need to uh, understand the kinds of interventions and treatments that are available so that you can provide appropriate counsel. And so I would uh, recommend that as you go through your curricula, you look for uh, those courses where these elements are very apparent and can be very helpful as you prepare for your eventual employment. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question. Good evening. My name is Michael Wood. I'm the first year student, PhD student here at Penn State, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak before you. Uh, President Erickson and leadership, thank you very much for providing the opportunity for us to to come together and communicate. Uh, as a former athletic director and 20-year coach at levels from elementary school to high school, I'm very appalled at the lack of more responsibility of the athletic department. As I view the hierarchy of the previous and current athletic department, uh, what concerns me is the lack of cultural diversity in those offices. What are the steps uh, that are going to be taken to bring a qualified person uh, of color uh, into the athletic department? Well, uh, thank you for that question. The, uh, the meetings that, uh, that I'm having with, uh, with personnel there uh, will certainly stress uh, a whole range of issues. Um, I'm uh, frankly uh, new to the athletics arena. Uh, my background has, has been uh, really entirely on the academic side. So uh, I'll be very frank with you. I have, I have much to learn about uh, athletics. Uh, and I, I described it uh, earlier today as, uh, as drinking from a fire hose. Uh, there, there are just uh, so many aspects uh, in, in, in everything from, uh, from compliance to, uh, uh, to conferences, and, and uh, the list goes uh, on and on. But, uh, but my intent is to, to be a fast learner, uh, to ask lots of uh, difficult questions, and to, uh, to push on whatever areas there are in uh, uh, intercollegiate athletics uh, where we need to do uh, uh, work. We have a question here. Hi, my name is Carita Joseph, and um, Joe Paterno has typically been the brand and the face of Penn State, and I was just wondering how do you intend to rebrand Penn State so when you think of Penn State, instead of maybe thinking of the scandal and the whole Joe Paterno thing, we have a better connotation? I'll take that one. Uh, it's a good question. You know, I, uh, before I came to Penn State about 40 months ago, I had spent uh, nearly a lifetime, 33 years at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, and there was a basketball coach there for many, many years named Bob Knight uh, who left that university in difficult circumstances, not entirely unlike uh, the recent events here. Uh, Bob Knight and Indiana University seemed to be synonymous with one another. It was not long after Bob Knight's departure that I think Indiana University uh, came to be noted more for the kinds of things that it truly should have always been noted for in terms of its academic excellence, the experience outside the classroom that went well beyond the basketball program. Uh, you know, Penn State, the one thing I know with, with absolute certainty is that this is truly a great university. It has been, had a great football program. I suspect it will continue to have a very successful and great football program. But I also think this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to find new ways to demonstrate to the world how excellent we are in every other respect. Uh, and the branding of Penn State will, I think, even more notably emphasize uh, the aspects that occur in the classroom, the experiences you have there, and the learning that takes place there, as well as the rich activities outside the classroom, both at University Park and on all the campuses. Uh, but I think all of us here uh, tonight and all those listening, uh, I think we have to turn our attention to that in, in new ways. We have to collaborate with that aim in mind uh, because uh, that's what, what we should be doing, and I think that's the challenge that's ahead of us. But I'm very optimistic that the world will quickly uh, move past these events and recognize Penn State for what it really is. Damon, I, okay. I, we have a question. Do you just want to respond? One, while you're getting a question, Sam, I, I just want to, uh, folks to remember that 
uh, about a year ago, a uh, little more than a year ago at this time, the Wall Street Journal identified Penn State as the number one place they wanted to hire graduates among a survey of, of 500 organizations. They said Penn State has bright, well-rounded, hard-working, dedicated graduates. You folks are all the same as those students were last year. You're all the same. You are those students. Uh, I just comment on the question about uh, what do we do going forward as it relates to now that Coach Paterno is no longer on the scene. Uh, I've been asked quite a bit over the 16 years that I've been at Penn State uh, exactly how much money Coach Paterno is responsible for raising for scholarships and buildings and so forth. Uh, and it's very hard to quantify. Certainly he was very, very helpful. But I think if you talk to the alumni and you talk to students, they realize that Penn State is so much more than just one person. Uh, we, we have uh, an incredible uh, array of people who are very loyal to this place. And I really think uh, we will become known now for the excellent students we have, for the success that the, our alumni have, uh, for the volunteerism that our alumni have out in their various communities, and for all the excellent programs that we do and, and have here at Penn State. Question here? Is this a follow-up to that question? Okay. All right, go ahead. Hi, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I'm Aubrey Full, and I'm a junior here at Penn State. My question was in reference to what you said, since Wall Street did recommend us as the number one hiring school, um, a lot of us are worried right now about how that's gonna reflect when we go out into the job market, because you know our degree now comes tacked with this. So what should we do when we're facing employers trying to talk to them about this, and how should we counteract that in interviews? Well, I must tell you that uh, our Career Services Office, uh, very early on in this experience, uh, reached out to all those primary employers that have always been so interested in Penn State students, just to determine whether there was any truth whatsoever to rumors that we were also hearing uh, about their loss of interest in Penn State. And I can assure you that universally we've been told that's not the case. Uh, they're not only not retreating from their uh, interest in Penn State students, many of them are re-emphasizing it. They're ratcheting it up, I, I think, in important ways. So I have every confidence that you don't have to worry about that because I think the people who employ Penn State students are very reasonable, intelligent, insightful folks. They understand what has happened here and who may have been responsible, and they do not hold Penn State students accountable for these activities. They still understand the value that you bring uh, to the experiences in, in their workplaces. Uh, so I don't think you have to worry about that. That said, uh, I and uh, several deans, uh, the director of career services and a representative from corporate relations uh, will be traveling to New York City, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. in the next uh, week and a half or so just to have conversations with many of these uh, primary employers in those locations uh, to answer any questions that they may have, to be as responsive to their concerns as we can be, uh, just to ensure that what we're hearing on the ground is, is accurate, uh, but, but I'm very confident that it is. So before we get to the next question, which I, I want to just put out there, I think there probably are a lot of follow-up questions to this particular issue, and I really want to encourage you to think about what those are and share them, and maybe we come back to this at a point. Do you have a follow-up specifically yeah, to there's, this? Yeah, there's follow-up right here. Okay. All right, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Kathy Rogers, and I've been blessed to spend 24 years in the military. By saying that, I've spent a long time in different areas of the world that don't know us because of football. One of those places is Louisiana. Needless to say, they don't know us for football. The reason why I ask this is because I have a senior in college now, and I'm a senior in college. And we are seeing the results of it, although I don't see it. It is going to be subconscious when they look at you, depending on your career field. My question to you is, although our alumni are outstanding, and they are doing a lot right now that we might not see, what are we doing, or what are they doing that we do not see? Or what can we do to bring them um, out more visibly to show exactly what we are at Penn State, that we are more than what they see on TV. Um, 
Well, let me take that one. Uh, one of the responsibilities I have with great help from Roger Williams, who is the uh, executive director of the Alumni Association, is to uh, really inform and involve uh, our 550,000 living alumni. And since the, the, uh, these events uh, uh, started uh, nearly a month ago, we have been uh, very much in contact with our alumni in lots of different ways. Most of you are familiar with the 10,000 plus alumni now who have expressed their uh, their, their uh, help of victims through uh, an organization called RAIN, uh, which has been terrific. Um, we are planning to go out and meet with a lot of these people. Uh, President Erickson has offered uh, us some time in early January to go to some of the major cities in this country to communicate in town hall meetings just like this, not a, not a long social affair, but really a, a, a true meeting like this uh, for us to inform alumni so they can be better enabled uh, to uh, tell the tell the Penn State story, tell what we're doing to go forward and move forward as, as uh, uh, Dr. Erickson has expressed. Uh, so we are trying to uh, really take advantage. One of the wonderful things we have here at Penn State uh, that very few institutions have is a tremendous loyal alumni body. And I see, while many of them are saddened and upset, some angry, some feeling betrayal, uh, many, many of them are now saying, we want to help this institution. Uh, I see it daily in the emails we're getting. Roger Williams has gotten lots and lots of, uh, uh, of emails about this, people reaching out to help to, to really, uh, uh, really restore and make proud and better that Penn State pride. So I, I, I am confident. I've had calls from uh, donors, for example, to say, look, uh, I'm just calling to tell you we're standing by you here. Uh, so I've had, I'm, I'm confident that this large, powerful alumni body that we have are, are certainly going to be with us here for the long haul. They care about this place deeply. I'd like to add to that because I, I understand how worried you might be. Um, I want to reassure those who are at the Commonwealth campuses that alumni want to open doors for you. They have, they have expressed concern. Remember that, that we measure our own success by your success, and we do want very much to help each other, and who best to do that but the wonderful alumni, just as Rod was saying, who are available to us. They want you and, and other generations that follow you to be as successful as they might be, and um, I think no better connection um, can happen um, except through these wonderful, wonderful relationships that either await you or that you've been uh, fortunate enough to already experience. And I wanted to add one other thing. Um, at the campuses, uh, many of them hold career fairs and um, others um, send students to regional career fairs. And we're hearing also that employers are still very, very interested in our students. They are sending representatives um, to meet our students. Um, there's been no, there has been no fall off um, in, in that activity, and I'm, I'm happy to report that. I hope, I hope you have some solace with that. Yeah. Just uh, one thing I wanted to mention, I think your question was, was really good, is that sometimes I think people think that this is the kinds of issues that we're addressing that we need to address here just happen at Penn State and not other places. Okay. We, we know that human beings are are kind of capable of monstrous evils. That's, that's part of the human condition. They're also capable of, of tremendous good. Uh, there are you know, lots of studies that indicate that all you have to do is have people in authority tell you that it's a good thing to do and that people who normally wouldn't do really evil things will do evil things. And it's very important that we learn to question authority. And in many cases, being here and being part of this experience might actually make you a better human being and a better employee because we have to question authority and those who of us who are in authority have to be ready to answer those questions. Okay, so for those of you who came late or have tuned in late, this is the Penn State Town Hall Forum, an inspired event or an event that's been inspired by students, created by students to give students an opportunity to speak with members of the President's Council and President Rod Erickson. So we have a question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Darren Bishop. I'm a graduate student here. And 
I'm sure everyone would agree that this has been a very emotional time for all of us. Um, President Erickson and uh, Vice President Sims and others who might want to respond, just to kind of take this into a, another direction for a second and to make sure that we can relate to you and your experiences, I'm wondering if we could step back a little bit and go through the key events that have happened over the, these last few weeks, not just the grand jury report, but some others, and if you wouldn't mind sharing the emotions that you felt during those events. So uh, I'm Grad Dean, and so I guess I've got the microphone now. I'm also an alum, and uh, I moved here 11 years ago and brought my family with me, and my kids went to school here, and I'm very proud of that, and my spouse works here, and I'm proud of that too. So for 11 years, I've come to work, um, and it hasn't really been like work, uh, because I feel very much a part of Penn State. Uh, but as I said recently to a collegian reporter and something that was in the newspaper, uh, the last four weeks have been agonizing. Um, they've been agonizing for a lot of reasons. But, um, you know, first you read the presentment and you're shocked, can't believe it. Uh, and you think about it and, of course, somewhere in there, sadness, anger, all those things come up and, uh, you know, you just try to get on with it and go back to work and accept where you are and keep moving forward. Uh, I think the key to this is um, it's really apparent now, no, it's real, that we're all in this together. We always have been, but it's never been quite so apparent as it is now uh, for administrators, faculty, students, alums, and so forth. Our institution is under tremendous attack and uh, we're, we're feeling the pressure of that. Uh, so I think we have to think very carefully about what we say. You know, uh, I don't see any diminution in numbers of sponsors coming and companies coming, but once you're hired, you know, colleagues and others will ask you about this, and it's important to have thought about it and to think about what you'd say to them. Um, I've tried that, and I've certainly had to do that with a number of folks. Um, tomorrow morning, I'm happy to say, as some others have said here, that uh, Simmons Co Corporation will be here. I'll be kicking that off. And, they're here to hire students and to fill their pipeline. Uh, we have a lot of alums out there who are with major organizations, government, state government, federal government, um, corporations who are appalled by this and, uh, and want to do as much as they can uh, to make things right and to put it back on track. So for me, uh, I think I've said all I need to say except that it's been tough. It's been real tough. I'd like to, if, if I may, kick this question off to President Erickson, because I've heard so many people ask that question, wonder about how you must be feeling in the midst of all of this. I think Hank has, uh, has described my feelings uh, very well, too. Uh, I, uh, I first uh, learned that uh, these charges would be handed down the day before they were, and uh, it's, uh, it's shock, it's sadness, it's, uh, it's disbelief. Uh, that, uh, that something like this could have happened. And uh, then it's, uh, uh, it's really, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, how do we, how do we uh, respond to the needs of victims? How do we uh, help our students move forward? How do we provide the, the kind of counseling? Uh, how do we provide the opportunities for not just our students, but our, our faculty and staff uh, who, who have been deeply, deeply, uh, uh, just really uh, experiencing this, this tragedy so personally. Uh, so all of those kinds of emotions uh, were going on uh, at the same time that I was asked to step into this new role. Uh, it's certainly not the way that any university president would ever want to or imagine coming into this kind of, uh, of an awesome responsibility. Uh, but I uh, have also determined that uh, um, it, it was time for me to, to step up. Uh, this is a university that <laughs> means so much to me that I felt that I had to step up 
and, and really provide the kind of leadership that I thought we needed at this time. And so it's, it's been a, a whirlwind uh, three weeks. Uh, that's the only way to describe it because, as I say, I've, I've received uh, thousands of, of emails. Uh, I've tried to respond to as many of them as I could personally. Uh, many of them have been uh, offering a lot of suggestions uh, on, uh, on many different kinds of things. But what I've been really gratified about is uh, the way that, that uh, uh, the message is coming through. Uh, some of you may have read that I, I sent out a, uh, uh, a communication to students who have applied to Penn State and students who have uh, been uh, provided with, uh, with offers from the er early uh, round of, uh, of applications. And uh, uh, in the first instance, uh, our applications haven't fallen. They've run ahead, uh, continued to run ahead, in fact, by about 4% over last year's record rate. So there are prospective students out there who are still very, very interested in coming to Penn State. Uh, we have uh, over 40,000 baccalaureate applications in right now, and I'm told that only eight students have withdrawn their applications. And I've received just dozens of email feedback from, uh, from our prospective students who have applied saying, uh, I really want to come to Penn State. Uh, I understand that this wasn't something that represents the whole university. So uh, it's, there, there's a tremendous mix of, uh, of emotions, uh, uh, a tremendous sense of, of what a big job that we have ahead of us now, uh, but also a tremendous uh, buoying of spirit that uh, there are so many uh, individuals, not just Penn State alumni, but others that I'm hearing from uh, all across the country, uh, other university presidents, some of my older, provost colleagues uh, who are saying, uh, we know this isn't Penn State. We know that you're going to emerge from this better than ever. Uh, we're with you. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. OK. Um, I know a lot of these questions are complicated. The questions themselves are complicated, and the answers are also complicated. So it takes us a bit of time to get those things out. I'm just going to ask those of us in the audience and those of us who are panelists to try to just be more succinct in our questions and, and in our answers so that we can get so much. I, I have a lot of people here that are saying, please call on me. Can, so. How many people have questions so we have a sense of that? OK, we're going to be here a long time. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we just need to be so a little we'll, more succinct. We'll sure. I have a question from the World Campus from Kyle Shear. We're going to go in a slightly different direction. Thanks for those answers, uh, Hank and Rod, by the way. The Board of Trustees has expressed that they have, have and will continue to act in accordance with what is in the best interest of the university. As the recent events have unfolded, the actions by the Board of Trustees has cast skepticism and doubt over the ability of the Board to effectively lead and reside over a prestigious university such as Penn State. What is the Board of Trustees doing to try and regain this trust that has been compromised? And as a follow-up question, why does it appear, an emphasis on appear here, why does it appear that the Board of Trustees has made no attempt to do what is in the best interest of the student body? Wow, that was not a succinct question. No, that was not. <laughs> so I'm not sure how we're, we're going to... So can you say the, the succinct question there that we can a, get a response to? I think the, 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 um, there's a lot of skepticism about the board. And, and the reason I'm asking this question is because I have many people have asked this question. They, don't, they, they feel some kind of way about the board of trustees. They don't feel as though they really acted necessarily in the best interest of the university. And, we rea and, and uh, as some person says, we realize you may not be able to fully answer this question. But do you all have any thoughts about that? You know, how, what, well, do, what do you know that the board is doing? Have they made any decisions? Uh, I, I certainly would, uh, would say at the outlet, outset that I have uh, tremendous uh, support uh, for and admi admiration for the, the board. Uh, they were uh, faced with some very tough decisions, and, and they made those decisions. Uh, but I think more importantly to your, your current uh, question there, Sam, um, if you look at the, uh, the Special Investigations Task Force uh, and look at uh, who is on that task force, I think it should give uh, everyone a good deal of confidence 
Uh, it's chaired by, uh, by Ken Fraser, a very distinguished uh, CEO of Merck and Company. The vice chair is Ron Tamales, the Secretary of Education for Pennsylvania. It includes the chair of the faculty senate, among others, and so forth. But I think the big thing is uh, Judge Lewis Free uh, is the special independent counsel and Judge Free, of course, uh, served uh, very, in a very distinguished way as uh, director of the FBI and also as a federal judge. And he's been given full authority to look into this in every possible way, and we've made every possible commitment to, uh, to support that investigation, and the results will be public. We have a related question here. Um, hi, my name is Laura Bradley. I would like to thank you guys for your commitment to transparency, and this is great, and I hope we can do something like this in the future. Um, we're talking about the Board of Trustees, and we would like to see the Board of Trustees not being able to vote until they speak to the students and allow students to make comments and ask questions about major things like uh, getting new buildings or eliminations of departments or even arranging departments. We think that that would be really helpful to getting the students involved and also allowing them to understand what's going on and why things are happening. Well, uh, w with nearly 100,000 students at Penn State, uh, what we often have to do, uh, both the board and the administration, is rely on representatives of students uh, and the board, I think, uh, does that by having, attending all of the meetings, uh, the presidents of UPOA, CCSG, and GSA, who are the leaders, of course, who organized this event tonight. Uh, they also have a student uh, as a member of the Board of Trustees, uh, and that's been the case at Penn State for quite some time. So there are opportunities, of course, for the student voice to be included uh, in various fashions. When the board meets, uh, the, the sessions are open to the public. Uh, the, the Friday session is something that is available to you to attend if you'd like. Um, it's also the case that the board, uh, I think in recent uh, years, in the time that I've been here, they have expressed more interest, actually, uh, in interacting with students, student leaders and other students in various ways because I think they would like to hear more from students. And so there have been opportunities created for them to meet with representative groups of students to hear from, from those students what, uh, what they can and to ask the right kinds of questions to those students. Uh, so there are all kinds of ways in which the board is trying to, uh, to affect that. I think we are working hard to uh, allow that kind of interaction to occur. Uh, and to the extent that you and others have specific suggestions about how that might happen, I would welcome a conversation sometime after this meeting uh, that we might be able to talk, uh, talk through some possibilities. Hey, I, I want to interject here. Did, did you all hear what he said? What he said was the board would like to hear more from students. So it's incumbent upon you to speak to the board. So they're looking for your input. Mm -hmm. Can I just uh, offer, too, um, that the, our student body is very large and it's very diverse. And so it's very hard to get a collective voice. Um, there are only a couple of venues throughout your college careers where so many students come together for a dialogue. Uh, there's, there's the convocation, which isn't really a dialogue, and there's commencement, which also isn't really a dialogue. So this kind of meeting is really important. I, th I think a number of students have said that they appreciate this chance to, to voice how you feel and what your opinions are. And I, I think everyone up on the stage here would be very happy to continue this kind of dialogue. It's the way we can get kind of a collective viewpoint of such a, a, a variety of, of views. Maybe the next one we'll have the Board of Trustees up here next month. Right. Um. Hello, my name is Ryan Brown. Um, just have a quick question. I keep hearing you all speak about diversity and the different things that the board is trying to do in regards to getting student input and making the decisions that they make. Um, the question, similar to what um, this gentleman by me actually asked earlier about diversity is exactly, I heard Damon mention that UPUA, CCSG, and um, the Graduate Student Association have been actively involved in the planning and uh, decision-making that the board does. But what about 
the other student groups, um, you know, the smaller groups who have more of a connection with the minority population, the, the students of color, the, the international students, and, and just the, the wide variety of, of the students who make up this university, where I look around this room and there are very few faces of diversity in, in this room, it, it, it speaks volumes in, in my eyes to sort of how decisions are being made and who's being left out. And I wanted to know how you all felt um, in regards to you know, what the board is actually doing and what will be done to incorporate more of a, an actual diverse voice in making these decisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think I just need to remind us all how committed we are to um, extending a diversity. We, we know that, um, that learning um, is so dependent on diverse views, on meeting fellow students from other cultures and from other, um, uh, and who are multicultural at that. I, the board reaching out to student groups is certainly possible. Some of the ideas that were presented this evening, I think that we should bring up. And since we hear that the board wants to reach out to you, I think that it could, in fact, hear from groups that are organized around a certain theme or, um, and has a, a certain coherence of activity. Um, I think there is tremendous interest um, we are a diverse student body. I can speak for the Commonwealth campuses where we are very rich in diversity, and I think we offer wonderful experiences for our students. How many of the students here started at a, at a Commonwealth campus? Did you, and you probably met people that you would otherwise have never met in high school um, at those campuses. I don't know if you've continued those relationships. I hope you've expanded them once you've come to University Park. But those students who are at the Commonwealth campuses, I hope you realize that your horizons are broadened by the exposure you have. Um, so to answer your question, I would hope, going back to, I don't know which group you represent. Are you this graduate student? No, I'm, I'm the president of the Penn State Student Black Caucus, which serves as sort of a excellent, um, uh, like a governing body for the minority um, students here on this university. Excellent, uh, excellent. I, I, then I think you should reach out. We have a question here. Oh. Terrell, do you want to say one thing? Okay, go ahead, Terrell. Uh, Follow-up question. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I think we have to be careful about is sometimes think people think that an awareness of diversity is a function of your genetics and it's really not a function of your genetics, it's a function of your life experience and your education. Okay? And all of us have a responsibility to you know, expand our horizons in those areas. You talked about those other student leaders. Those other student leaders need to be speaking for you too because it's a function of their job to be committed to diversity just like it's a function of all of our jobs to be committed to these issues. Could I just say very quickly that I think the Board of Trustees has received uh, an enormous amount of attention in recent weeks because of very important decisions that it made. But just so you know, the Board of Trustees actually meets six times a year for what essentially is a half a day on each of those occasions. So you might have 24 hours of actual meeting time or something thereabouts in a year uh, that is part of the formal experience for the Board of Trustees. So the, the people up here in front of you and others like us are the ones who really need to be engaged with you on behalf of the board because they delegate to us this responsibility. And I think this is a good chance for us to start uh, engaging with you even more than we have. I'm going to go over here. Hi. My name is Anna Brew. I'm from United Students Against Sweatshops. And in terms of the Board of Trustees meeting, I've been to so many of them. Unfortunately, there's no room for questions at the Board of Trustees meeting. So you can sit and listen, but I don't think that that's the end all. Um, President Erickson, Penn State pays the Fair Labor Association $50,000 a year to monitor sweatshop conditions in factories producing Penn State apparel. 
But instead, what the FLA actually does is cover up the, covers up the abuses committed by hum, known human rights violators like Nike and Adidas, who sit on the FLA board. In light of Penn State's recent complacency in the cover-up of child rape, you have promised to reinforce our moral imperative of doing the right thing. Can we morally continue to pay the FLA when they, too, continue to turn a blind eye to the human rights offenders? As I, I think you know, I haven't uh, been involved in those discussions in the past. I think most of those discussions have uh, uh, involved uh, individuals in, in other parts of the university. But uh, it, it certainly is something that, uh, that I intend to, uh, to learn more about in the, uh, the weeks ahead. And, uh, and, and certainly uh, am willing to, uh, to listen, uh, to learn, and to, uh, to, to do what uh, is, is appropriate. So uh, I, I think that's part of our continuing dialogue. So I have a question uh, from Altoona Camp, absolutely from about four different campuses. And, and they all want to know about the Commonwealth campuses. And what are, what are we doing? President Erickson, one question to you is, are, do you, would you, are you planning to go and visit Commonwealth campuses? more than President Spanger did? And what else are we doing to really reach out to these Commonwealth campuses and make them a part of the University Park community? These are questions that are being asked. Well, I have been to, uh, to many of the Commonwealth campuses and continue to go to them. Um, I try to uh, get out there uh, when, whenever there's uh, some kind of event that's, that's happening. Uh, the last uh, three weeks, I haven't uh, gotten anywhere, unfortunately, other than uh, University Park. But uh, I certainly intend to, uh, to be visible on the campuses. Uh, as I say, I have been, uh, uh, as time would permit, over the years. And uh, I know that uh, Dr. Haynes is, uh, is out there on a regular basis. Uh, actually, we, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, talking about issues related to the Commonwealth campuses. Uh, I can attest that, uh, that every one of the individuals uh, here, my colleagues, uh, are, are involved in one way or another with what's happening uh, at the Commonwealth campuses, whether it's, it's, uh, it's curriculum or, or research or outreach or, or diversity or development uh, and student affairs. It, uh, it, uh, it really runs the gamut. Uh, the Commonwealth campuses are, are uh, uh, a very, very important uh, part of who we are at, at Penn State. And, uh, you know, my goal is to make sure that, uh, that no one ever forgets that. We have a yes or no question right here, so we want to go to that one. Uh, good evening to each of you and to each ev everybody out here. Um, I have a yes, no question, and um, I also want to tell you how I feel. My yes, no question is that, um, that I've heard that um, Joe Paterno had actually, Coach Joe Paterno, had reported the Sandusky incident to the chief of police at Penn State. Is, is that true? I don't think any of us here uh, have any, uh, any knowledge about the, the particulars of, of that. Okay, that, that means no, that you don't know. Okay, now I'll tell you how I feel, I don't know, if, all of you feel this way, but Sandusky was part of the Penn State family. We all are. And I feel shame. <laughs> what do I do with these feelings? Here, can you? That's how you feel. Again, again you, said you have to a, acknowledge them. You have to recognize how you feel, and admit it. And a lot of us feel similar feelings, and uh, there's nothing wrong with feeling like that at all. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with expressing that you feel that way either. Uh, I think it's completely understandable. That's why it's important to talk to each other about this. I also think that I'm so happy that you shared that. And I think that 
what we're learning in this community is that there are plenty of times in times like this to, to just witness, you know, and to just hold that and not to necessarily have an answer. So um, thank you. I just wanted to respond. Um, I, we all feel so deeply about what you just said. Um, when I was growing up, um, I, I came from a Russian home and my grandparents lived with us. And if there was ever a major incident, um, they ruled the family with a very kind approach to discipline. But if they used the word shame, we knew that it was time to get into shape. Shame was a very strong word. You chose it carefully. It meant very much to you. And, and I do appreciate hearing that. Um, it is most unfortunate that what should be a milestone in, in your careers going to college should present the fondest memories for you has been interrupted and, and you are distracted. Um, and I'm hoping that, and you know, Dr. Erickson said earlier that these horrific allegations and the events surrounding them do not define you. And remember that, they do not define you. And I would hope and I would submit to you that we should emerge from this more compassionate and with resolve. And I think, um, I think going forward, the communities that you will join will benefit from that compassion that you will, you will learn and have learned. Mm -hmm. I think the other important point is that uh, people grieve at different speeds in different ways. And to realize that some people have moved further along and others are still grieving terribly, and to allow people to experience where they are, and as others said, to talk and to share. Yeah, one of the things when we were, the question about how we're all feeling and coping with this, uh, all of us, I think, have cried publicly, have cried privately about this. I have several times. Um, yet one of the things that I feel tremendously now about Penn State is that we are bonding together as a community, and we talk about the Penn State family before, and we talk about the Penn State family now, and I think it means so much more, at least to me, my personal feelings about this, and how this community, this family, really is bonding and coming together, uh, not to protect this community in that kind of context of ourselves against the world, but really to say who we really are and to express who we really are uh, to each other and to the world. And in that kind of context, uh, as we work together, all of us are kind of outside our comfort zone right now. And, but because of that, I think we've bonded to help each other. And I hope that you're finding amongst your peers and friends and so forth that you can do that as well, to, to find each other and talk to each other in new ways and kinder ways. I've talked to my staff about random acts of kindness, and we all need more of that these days. Yeah, I, th I think on a s similar theme, I, I don't know whether one emotion can displace another. I think they coexist. Um, but I know, and I think a lot of us have said we've gone through a real ro roller coaster over the last several weeks. But I know I felt so much disappointment, maybe shame, but it was displaced in some ways by the, the tremendous pride I felt about the, the candlelight vigil and the other kinds of expressions that students did spontaneously uh, that, that really set the, a different tone, uh, recognized how the whole community was feeling. So I, I, I think those, those, the coexistence of those emotions is a very positive thing and something that helps you move forward. Yeah, I also think that there, there, are, there are many lessons to be learned from this event. There, there, there are many things, many mistakes that we made that I think we all have to look at, and that this is a learning event. There are, there, there, there are things for us to learn that are very positive about ourselves, about how we dig our way out of this in the process. One of the things that I come away from this is that uh, a resolution, and that is this will never happen again on my watch. Hi, my name's uh, Aaron Dillon. I'm an undergraduate student here at Penn State. And um, my question is, 
that when I came here, when I came to Penn State, I came here on the sole purpose of the integrity principle. And pretty much, I'll be honest too, growing up in this town, um, knowing everybody from through family connections, Tim on down, um, my concern here is how do you define integrity when you still have a coach who's on board who clearly lied with his grand jury present me and what he has recently said. How do you take action with that to send a message that you are about integrity and not about what is best media wise and this is a university and I am proud of all of these students here who did do the candlelight vigil that really touched my heart, you know, and I honestly don't think what I asked myself, what did the board expect the night they announced that, time-wise, everything. But, um, you know, that's why I came to Penn State, because it did hold two integrity views. And I myself have been through things in my life that I wish I could have done a lot better. My question is, how do you uh, intend to reestablish integrity to this university? Well, in integrity is, is doing the right thing. Uh, day in, day out, first time, every time, and, uh, and we all have to, to recommit to that. Uh, I also want to point out that, uh, that we all need to remember that there is a, a continuing criminal investigation that is going on. And I think we all need to be aware of that. Uh, there's, uh, there's tremendous speculation that's going on uh, in the media about uh, virtually everything uh, related to the university at this time, uh, but uh, there are, there are certain uh, uh, rights that uh, that individuals have, certain uh, uh, rights that uh, that witnesses have, uh, and uh, and we're, there are some aspects that that uh, frankly are just going to have to play out uh, and play out in the legal system uh, before. All of uh, all of the dust can settle on this, uh, so uh, you know we we do have to uh, we have to do be mindful of that, uh, but at the same time, uh, around all of those activities, uh, we have to uh, to make sure that uh, that we're doing the honest, open, and right things. So I have a follow up to that question from the Lehigh Valley campus from Derek uh, Stack, who's a senior. He says, with considerations to the inevitable settlements and court fees for which the university will be responsible financially, as well as perpetually increasing tuition, or so it seems, what steps will be taken to ensure that students won't be the ones shouldering the bill for the decisions of the previous administration? Uh, uh, that one, uh, that question is, really has a straightforward answer. Penn State, like uh, most universities, most of our peer university, all of our peer universities, uh, is, is insured for those kinds of things, both for the actions of directors and officers, as well as general liability insurance. We have a question here. Um, it's a comment followed by two questions. The first comment is, I really don't know how to feel about the situation. Um, we're still hearing things. and. I'm just in shock still, um, and honestly, we just have to let the legal system play itself out. And hearing people just rip us on the radio and making jokes about the situation, and it's only been about two weeks. Um, the university is to blame, but we're not the only people to blame. A lot of people failed these kids. Society, not all society, but the society that impacted these kids failed these kids. And it's a shame that we're the only ones taking blame, even though we are wrong. Um, the two questions I have are about transparency, which was mentioned earlier. We're talking about transparency, and with the investigation, I heard that there are going to be two Penn State people on the board that Judge Free is going to be running um, to do a university-wide investigation. My question is, do you feel that that is going to conflict with the transparency, that there might not be anything convoluted in that? And the other thing is with the athletic department, um, I think we can all agree that there is, at least in my opinion, zero transparency um, coming from somebody who's trying to get into the department. And I mean, it is a personal question because I do want to get into the department, but um, what can we do 
to make sure that the um, that the department has more transparency, so that way things like this don't happen again, and things like lack of institutional control don't happen again, because it's a shame that it happened. Okay. And you say, what can we do? You mean, what can students do? What can students and the Board of Trustees do? To ensure transparency in the athletic department in particular, you are asking, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's a role for uh, for a lot of uh, different individuals and groups to play. Uh, the faculty senate, for example, is uh, is looking at that very same issue about uh, how do they relate to the uh, to to intercollegiate athletics as a, as a group. Um, the actions that that I've been taking over the last several weeks are are meant to provide that kind of transparency. Uh, for example, in the uh, the uh, appointment of a uh, search committee for the uh, the head coach, the head football coach, um, we have two faculty members uh, on that committee. Uh, one who's been involved for very many years in a lot of these issues related to intercollegiate athletics and at at uh, big time sports at universities, and also uh, our faculty athletic representative, the NCAA. So uh, I wanted to have, uh, to make sure that we had a, a very strong uh, faculty academic um, aspect to, to the search and that, uh, that whomever comes into this position would have strong academic values and, and appreciate uh, that uh, part of the university. Uh, so I, th I think what, uh, what, what students uh, can do is, is to continue to uh, ask for and uh, and really demand more more tan transparency uh, in in uh, uh, different functions of the university, not just intercollegiate athletics, but uh, in other areas as well, and particularly uh, uh, work through uh, student government leaders, uh, uh, student organizations, and so on. Uh, your your elected student leaders uh, do a do an excellent job, in my opinion, of of bringing issues forward on behalf of, uh, of the student body. So I would strongly urge you to continue to work uh, through those channels. We have another question here on transparency. Yeah, but I, I wanna say something to students again, if I could. Okay. I, I just wanna emphasize, you heard what the president of the university just said. He's saying that we're asking, you know, you can demand it. You can, you know, come forward and ask. Put your, put your thoughts out there. You know, they're asking for your thoughts, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is good timing because my question also concerns transparency. And um, given the candid, candid spirit of this town hall forum, I was wondering if you as president, I'm, I'm making the assumption that you have information about the inner decisions and workings of the university that I might not have as a student. They're more readily available to you. And I was wondering if you could possibly share something that you think as a student I would like to know about my university, just given your commitment to transparency. Well, first of all, uh, even those of us uh, uh, who sit in the highest levels of uh, uh, positions here in the administration of the university uh, wouldn't pretend to know everything that's going on in the university. There, there are, uh, we, we are a big city. We're 96,000 students. We're something like 27,000 full-time faculty and staff. Uh, and we're, we're 500,000 alumni who are connected in de to varying degrees with the university. So we're, a, we're a, in many senses, a big metropolitan area, and I can't sit here and tell you that I know what everybody is doing, uh, nor do I have, can I take responsibility uh, in that sense for, for what everyone does. And, and, and that's why it's so important that we drive that message down that that uh, that transparency and responsibility and so forth uh, is is really everybody's business in the university, uh, and that's why we have, for example, all of these hotlines. We just introduced a, a hotline yesterday for for sexual abuse and and relationship violence that that hopefully you all saw uh, the release about. But there's there are other hotlines too for things like uh, uh, like. Uh, ethical violations and non-compliance. 
what you would, would particularly want to know, uh, I, I can't begin to imagine uh, you know, what it might be, uh, whether it's something about uh, your, your particular major that you're interested in or... Uh, my personal, I'm speaking from, like I'm a representative of the students, but as a, maybe something that all students might want to know. Um, that, you know, in the hopes that you could tell us and the students could enter into the conversation about it, it a decision being made in the yeah. university. I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the budget crisis or last semester, um, and t transparency came up a lot then when that was all happening, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be related to that, but just anything within the university. Well, probably the, uh, the biggest thing that students want to know about is tuition, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to want to understand more uh, how decisions are made about tuition and what are the various factors and so forth uh, that go into this. Um, we uh, we certainly could uh, make those decisions uh, much more transparent, and certainly I'd be willing to sit down with students and talk about it. We do now. Uh, certainly, we provide a budget briefing uh, and talk about some of those issues with student leaders and so on. But uh, I think that issue of, uh, of tuition and the cost of education will continue to be uh, important questions that students want to hear about. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, I certainly would be, uh, be very happy to sit down with students and talk because I think that when you understand some of the, the issues, uh, some students say, well, uh, you just can't have any tuition increase this year. Uh, there are costs uh, of everything that's uh, that's going up, not just the faculty and staff, but uh, but other costs, energy, food, everything else is going up. But I'd be happy to sit down and talk with students about that. Okay, so I have a question up here, but before I do so, let me say once again, if you've come in late, this is the Penn State Town Hall Forum in which students have the opportunity to have a conversation with the President's Council and President Rodney Erickson at Penn State, and I want to say once again, we have a lot of questions to get to, and we're going to be here very late, so let's try to keep things pretty short at this point. We do have a question. Thank you. I'll try to make this quick. Um, my name is Heather Hoddle. I am a graduate student um, as well as an instructor here at Penn State, um, so I've had conversations with professors, students involved in research, and also with students. Um, the university is currently in the middle of its For the Future campaign. Um, so. Um, Dr. Kirsch and Dr. Foley, these, these might both be pertinent to you, um, which has been uh, touted as, play, as placing student scholarships as one of its priorities. Um, and in terms of fundraising, it's, go, it's expected that um, the university will lose some donations in, in light of the scandal. Um, it can probably obviously be expected. Um, so how does the university expect to make up for this lack in funding? Um, and um, if, if there are funds, obviously there's this past year there's been discussions about problems with the budget, um, a lot of discussion around the um, College of Agriculture. Um, what what will, uh, will the university do about this and what will be cut um, if we're not doing anything about tuition? And um, so what, what cuts will be made and in terms of research funding, will that be affected? Well, let, let me address a little bit about the fundraising piece of this. Uh, and a lot of what we do with fundraising doesn't necessarily directly support the operating budget of the university, but a lot of it, as you say, is, is directed in, uh, in support of, uh, of, of students, both undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, we will lose some gifts, to be honest with you, but we're not falling off the fundraising cliff by any measure at all. I want to assure you that. In fact, in the next uh, week to two weeks, we're going to announce some very large gifts that, that are going to be given to Penn State. Uh, and these are people who have made these decisions after these events have taken place who are still standing by us. Uh, we have good metrics and indicators that many of you know that we do uh, something called the Lion Line here, where students are involved in calling alumni. And we have had uh, results that we've tracked very carefully since uh, these events have taken place. And we're basically running the same as we were last year in terms of alumni responding to this. Uh, we've also had alumni call who have wanted to make gifts to uh, show their stands for support. Uh, so uh, I want to reassure you that, yeah, we're going to have a bump in the road here. And we, uh, the biggest challenge we have with fundraising is that we're going to lose a little bit of time as we try to work our way through and, and, and move forward. But rest assured, there are a lot of Penn Staters who believe in this place, and they believe in you, and they're going to support you. Yeah, I'll take the research 
part of that. Um, we've had a good run for 10 years. We, we've had growth of about 7.5% a year, year over year in research expenditures, which is extraordinary. Uh, a lot of good reasons for that. I won't go into all of them now in the interest of short answers. Uh, but the short answer is the, the economy has contracted. The government is finally feeling that. We're going to feel some compression of federal resources. None of that has anything to do with this scandal. That's just a natural process. It's a cycle. One of the things we are trying to do, though, is to build on the fact that uh, uh, corporations really like Penn State, and they still like Penn State. Uh, they like our students, they like our research, and we want to make it even easier for them to do research with us. So, you know, we've talked a lot about this and the president has agreed that, you know, on things like industrial contracts from now on, we're not going to fight to have the intellectual property, which we've done for years, because that tends to be a, um, a negative inducement to working with us. We want our students working with uh, people on the outside, we want our faculty working with people who are in practice, want them working on really good problems that corporations and industry uh, meet every day. So then they go back in the classroom, they're even better instructors and better teachers than they would be otherwise. And they, the students have places to go where they're really wanted as uh, engineers, scientists, as uh, health professionals, as, as whatever. So we want to make that easier, not harder. Will it remedy everything? No, I don't think it will. But I can't tell you what the upside or the downside is in any given year. It's like Yogi Berra said, it's hard to predict the future, especially, uh, what is it, the future or something. Terrell, how's that go again? I can never remember how it goes. It ain't what it used to be. But anyway, that's, that's what I'd have to say about that. Okay, we have a question here. I'm gonna ask you to stand hard up. Hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Be so. Before we um, have this question though, I just wanna ask everybody once again, to ha it's, there's a lot of questions and if we could just say them quickly without a lot of prefacing and then answer them kind of quickly without a lot of whatever the opposite of prefacing is. <laughs> that would be helpful. Okay, I might preface a little bit. Um, so my name is Brianna Serrano. I'm a graduate student in the College Student Affairs Program and I work with students directly at the LGBTA Student Resource Center. Um, and the week after this incident occurred, um, many of the students spoke about their frustrations because we did have an open, open forum there. They spoke about their fr frustrations of the administration not allowing them to voice their opinion like we are doing here now. So my question is, why did it take three weeks in order for this to happen? And also, how can we in the future be more proactive instead of reactive? One mic should do. Uh, I, I must tell you that uh, it, no one is more frustrated with the early part of this whole experience than the people sitting up here on the stage, I think. Um, as has already been noted, again, this involves an ongoing criminal investigation. As you might guess, these things unfold very quickly. Uh, it's very difficult for us to react as quickly as we would like because we were learning things literally about the same time you were learning things. Uh, we're, so this is all happening sort of in real time for all of us. At the same time that we're dealing with this crisis that is uh, completely unpredictable, no one could have foreseen what we've uh, had to deal with, uh, we also had a university that needed to be run. So we tried to continue to teach classes, do research, make sure that the lights are, are on and the heat is, is, is there. Uh, so this has been a very difficult period. Uh, so I think that, uh, from my perspective at least, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for my colleagues, we share some of your frustration, and that's one of the reasons we're so happy for this evening's event, a chance to actually be responsive, to be engaged in a real conversation with you that is not going to be a one-time and off kind of experience. We want to find effective, uh, appropriate ways to continue this kind of dialogue with you so that we can avoid uh, any of these miscommunications in the future. Okay, I have a question in the back. Hi, my name is Doug. I'm an undergraduate in the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, did the national media bully Penn State into making a decision? If so, did this lead to a rash decision? No. That was the short answer. Oh, that was good. That's good. Okay. That's we have another question. Uh, hi, my name is Chase England. Uh, my question is for President Erickson or whoever wants to answer it. Uh, 
In your view, why is it that uh, Mr. Curley and Mr. Schultz did not receive the same public reprimand that Mr. Paterno did, and why is it that they continue to receive benefits from the university? As they've both been accused of perjury, doesn't this fly in the face of the purported values of honesty and integrity here? Uh, as I said earlier, there, there is an ongoing investigation uh, that will continue with court proceedings and so on. And um, the, uh, the particular situation of, uh, of any of these individuals is, uh, is still subject to, uh, to further consideration. Mm -hmm. I have a question back here. Oh, okay. Um, uh, my name is Rowan Nasser. I'm an international student from Saudi Arabia and also a senior here in Penn State. I'm going to make this short. Um, Penn State students have a lot of pride in this university. And some say that this Penn State spirit comes from the culture of football that we consider a big part of our identity. Um, sorry. Uh, what I want to ask is that we all know that there is a football-focused revenue stream. And I just want to ask if that's going to change in any way and if there's going to be a shift in our priorities. Well, as most of our international students know, we don't play real football here anyway, right? <laughs> uh, it's called soccer here. Um, uh, but uh, we, will, uh, we will certainly uh, uh, you know, move forward. Um, I, I don't think that uh, that football ever has defined us. I hope that's uh, not the case, or nor that it ever will be. Uh, I'm a scholar, first and foremost, that happens to do administrative leadership uh, work for the university. And, uh, and my goal always has been and will continue to be that Penn State be defined as a great academic institution, a world-class institution, uh, rather than being defined the other way around. Okay. Have a question I, here? Can I? Can we go back here? Yeah. Go fast. This, okay. I think this follows. I guess so. Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Easterbrook. Uh, students have identified a lot of issues here uh, tonight that y you've addressed, like uh, interviews and, and applications, and, and the feedback from you guys seems to be relatively positive. Uh, that these things aren't as big of an issue as, as we fear. Uh, what would you uh, identify as the major problems, like three major problems that need to be addressed uh, in the coming weeks? I'll let my colleagues respond to that. Three. I think the first one is stuff like this so that we all regain trust and recognize we're actually all in this together, not separately. <clears throat> I think secondly, as a student, it's going to be hard, but it's important to focus on the end of the semester things and take care of yourself and what you need to do to get through that well. I don't mean to say it's easy. I don't think it will be. Uh, and the third thing is, I can't remember. <laughs> I have to, I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. That was an allusion to a candidate uh, for president. I, I, I think the third thing is uh, to recognize and I'll say this, maybe it's a little daring, but none of you are guilty. Uh, you came to Penn State, you're not guilty of anything. Um, you may feel shame, but you're not guilty of anything. Uh, we'll set this right, and I think it's gonna take time, and we're gonna get beat up along the way as we have been. Uh, probably wasn't supposed to say that either, but um, that's how I feel, and I think you gotta recognize that and just keep doing what you came here to do. I think it's really critical to focus on healing. A number of us had comparable meetings like this with our own staff, open town hall meetings, and a lot of things that you've shared, a lot of our staff have shared. I think people need time to heal. I think also it's really critical for us to take advantage of this opportunity to really focus on a very critical issue that the Penn State community has incredible resources that we can bring to bear to help improve the situation that uh, occurred here on campus that uh, has caused such grave, grave problems. Yeah, I, I think in in, uh, in the days to come, we're we're going to be prepared to talk about some things that we're going to do on a national scale uh, to address some of these things in a very positive way, 
and that and these things are going to be uh, uh, asking for your help, for faculty help, for our alumni to help us. Um, and so uh, I think that's going to be important for us to, to focus on those things because uh, that's part of we're, we're all part of the solution here. You should hold your heads high and you should go home and talk proudly about your experiences at Penn State. And I know a lot of you did over Thanksgiving break uh, do that. Uh, from my part of the world at Penn State, one of the things that we need to do is really harness uh, the energy of our alumni, and we're starting to do that. And we also need to communicate with our alumni very much the way we're doing here, and we intend to do a lot of that uh, this spring semester. So I want to say a, a quick question then uh, from Ray Afandiev from Abington campuses, you know, the future of Penn State, but really in your estimation, what specifically can, can Penn State students do to help, to help you? And it sounds like you maybe don't have any specific things except get involved. You're asking for the involvement of students. That's what I'm hearing. That's how I'm, what I'm hearing that you would respond to Ray. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think you can be involved in many ways as well. You can be involved in the classroom. Uh, I think it's very fruitful to help faculty bring these issues into the classroom. It, it, they're generic to so many different fields, and they can be approached in so many different ways. They really do relate to so much of our curriculum. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can do it in your research, uh, whether it's undergraduate or graduate. And if, we, if you go to our um, research exhibitions, you will find uh, many topics that are, cover these kinds of issues. Um, and I think you can do it in your service, um, the, the service learning opportunities at the university um, and all the different ways that you can be involved through your clubs and, and other uh, student organizations. Okay. Yeah, and I think that this is an opportunity that invites all of us, students, faculty, staff, alums, uh, everyone who's part of the Penn State family, to actually take a, a, a few moments, if not much more time than that, to reflect on issues of character and conscience and social responsibility in ways that I think we always have, but now we really have, uh, I, I think, an imperative that we do this even more acutely than we have in the past. Uh, how we are defined is going to be less about the experience of the last three or four weeks than the things that we do going forward in the weeks and months and years ahead. We get to choose, in effect, how we are going to do, be defined as a, a university community. And I think we have an opportunity collectively together uh, to, uh, to pursue a definition that is something that we can all be very, very proud of. We can learn from it, uh, that experience individually, and we can certainly uh, learn from it collectively. Uh, hi, my name is Devin Edwards. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student, and uh, in the wake of the decision that the investigative committee does not have an undergraduate student, uh, I know that Pete does great work as the student representative uh, on the board of trustees, uh, but I was wondering how the decision was made not to include an undergraduate voice uh, on, on such an important uh, procedure. I think actually we might have a response to that question right back here. Hi, well, in the interest of transparency, I was about to introduce myself. I'm Rodney Hughes, I'm not an undergraduate, I am a graduate student, but I am the student representing all of you on the Special Investigative Committee. Uh, I just want, no, well, <laughs> say, say, save that, save that. Um, no, I just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, I got an undergraduate degree in economics from Penn State, uh, graduated in 2007, I've been here since then as a graduate student. Uh, I started as a graduate student in economics, uh, applied for uh, the student trustee position, uh, served on the board for three and a half years. Uh, through that process, uh, I actually decided to switch my graduate program into higher ed uh, to learn more about universities, to learn more about tuition, to learn more about a lot of the questions that I heard uh, interacting with students. Obviously, didn't reach everybody. Um, I think that's obviously clear from a lot of the concerns that do remain. But Peter Corey is here, and he's the student trustee now, and he shares a lot of the concerns, a lot of the goals that I had. So uh, I know Pete's very open to hearing from all of you and talking with you. But uh, I am not an undergraduate. I did my undergrad degree here. The one thing I did want to say, you know, keeping in mind that the investigation's ongoing, can't talk about everything, I really would be happy to introduce myself to all of you to let you know that there's a face with the name that's on the committee roster showing up in the collegian. Um, I am a person, I do care about Penn State, and I'm gonna do my best for all of you. So to hear your concerns, your questions that you have, 
I'm there for that. If you want to know who I am, I'm there for that. And I'm going to do everything that I can for Penn State. Rod, I only have question. one question, Rodney. Where'd you get that sweatshirt? <laughs> we have a Louis. question here. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Matt Bono. I'm a graduate student. Um, we keep talking about commissions and hotlines and compliance officers, but this is all completely dependent on all ability to get information from the students to these administrators. But from a student perspective, it's quite it's risky for us to do that. Um, there could be retaliation against us for voicing concerns. My question to you is, who is going to protect us from retaliation if we do bring concerns up to these various new channels? Well, what I would say is uh, you know, there are provisions in the law that protect people when they uh, give information to authorities about wrongdoing. Uh, whistleblower statutes are typically what you hear them referred as. Uh, and so there are those, those protections for you. I also can tell you that the university, you, 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 your question seemed to suggest that there was some anxiety about how the university might uh, respond to any uh, accusations that students may make. One of my jobs is to protect uh, both your uh, responsibilities and your rights. Uh, and I assure you that my colleagues up here share the view that uh, students uh, and, and others in the institution will not be subject to retaliation for making evident to those who need to know when wrongdoing has occurred, when there are anxieties about behavior in our community. Uh, because we've all been, been affected by this uh, in, in, in very profound ways too. We want to root it out where there is uh, inappropriate behavior, uh, and we want to work with you as partners in this community to, to make that happen. So I have a question, a quick question from the Lehigh Valley campus. Uh, completely different direction. Can you please address the rumors about possibly taking down the statue of Joe Paterno and renaming the Paterno Library? A number of people have asked that. There's certainly no plans uh, to take down Joe Paterno's uh, statue. Uh, we've heard all sorts of rumors to that effect, uh, and uh, they're not true, um, nor is there uh, uh, any, uh, any truth to the, the rumors about uh, taking the name off the library uh, at uh, some appropriate uh, time down the road. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, an opportunity to uh, also uh, uh, reflect uh, on uh, the, uh, the many years uh, uh, of, uh, of service that, uh, that Joe and, uh, and Sue provided to the university and the, the many uh, good things that they've done for Penn State. Mm -hmm. Question. Question here. Hi, uh, my name is Colin Edgar Smith. Thanks a lot, guys, for coming out. I really appreciate this, and I know everyone else does too. Um, in an emergency meeting Friday, uh, the week before Thanksgiving, uh, the Faculty Senate stressed the importance uh, of an impartial special committee that is not dominated by people affiliated with Penn State. Based on this information, how do you plan on addressing the concerns of the faculty? Uh, there was uh, just recently a meeting to, um, of the Senate Council, which is a smaller representative group of uh, faculty from the various units of the university, to decide how that resolution could be addressed. It's, it's a resolution uh, proposed by the Senate, but it hasn't, there's no detail wrapped around it. It's simply a, res a resolution to form uh, requesting an uh, independent committee. It's not clear exactly what that committee might do, uh, what the charge to the committee m might be, um, what directions it might take. So there is a, an, an upcoming meeting of the Senate on December 6th. Uh, that will be the subject of a forensic session where faculty will sort, sort this out. And then we'll know better you know, what their intentions are, what their concerns are, and how they uh, would like to proceed on that. OK, we have a question up front. Uh, hello, my name is Ben Jumanville, and I'm an undergraduate in the College of Liberal Arts. 
Uh, we all know our U.S. Constitution calls us to respect the accused and view them as innocent until proven guilty. So why, with everything that's going on here, is there such a rush of judgment? And also, what example does the Board of Trustees give to crime law and justice students when they let public opinion influence their decision making as opposed to due process? I think I answered the uh, the latter part of that uh, that question uh, a few minutes ago with a short answer, um, but uh, but certainly there there are um, there are a wide range of opinions uh, across the entire country uh, about uh, all of the uh, the circumstances, the individuals, and so on. And uh, uh, I've I've certainly heard from uh, from many of them. Uh, but certainly there will be uh, there will be much to be learned uh, over the course of the uh, the months and perhaps even beyond months and into the year or or more ahead and uh, I, I can also uh, tell you that we're likely to see lots of ups and downs in terms of the way Penn State uh, uh, is uh, is viewed and portrayed in the in the media because as as various court appearances and other things take place, uh, we're going to see spikes in in uh, the uh, the amount of interest uh, and certainly opinion of people uh, all across the country. So uh, I think you should all be uh, be prepared for that. That uh, this this will happen. These things will will come up, rise and fall again. And uh, I'm sure we will will hear about them, uh, but that's uh, that's part of a democracy that people uh, have uh, a right to express their opinions uh, on uh, just about any matter. A question here. Hi, my name is John Fitzgerald. I'm a student here and I'm a member of United Students Against Sweatshops here on campus. President Erickson, as we continue to receive international public scrutiny. Penn State needs to show that it will address the structural flaws that allowed such shameful acts to occur and the cover-up to continue. Two of, these Penn, two of these steps Penn State should take to restore faith in our university are, one, include a student presence on the Board of Trustees in the form of six student elected representatives rather than one governor appointed one, and two, introduce term limits for presidents of no more than 10 years. What is your stance on each of these recommendations and why? Well, I can start with the last. I don't intend to be president in 10 years, so, so we can, we can, we can so take you care of that So one you right support away. that one, right? Um, uh, secondly, the, uh, the, the Board of uh, Trustees has, uh, has bylaws that determine how the, uh, the board is organized. I have no influence over that. And uh, the other question was really about uh, USAS, uh, and I think I responded earlier to, uh, to one of your uh, colleague students about that. But uh, um, we'll, we'll listen, we'll learn. Okay, here we have a question up front. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Paul, and uh, I'm a senior in political science this year. There seems to be a lot of talk today about uh, you guys wanting us to go through our respective student organizations in order to work with you. Well, any student who's in the know knows that UPUA is little more than a dog and pony show, that they're told what to say, they come out, they say what, they, what they're told to do, and they do whatever you tell them. Uh, they're given a token budget, and that's about it. Um, so, what, so where do you stand as far as being able to actually give the UPUA actual power within the university? actually be able to do things besides spend a token budget? And also in the same vein, where do you stand as far as increasing the power of the Faculty Senate? We'll, we'll, uh, we'll let UPUA respond to that also, but go ahead. Yeah, I was going to suggest that. There are plenty of UPUA people here tonight, I think. Uh, you know, it's been my experience that UPUA and other key student government uh, organizations are anything but dog and pony shows. Uh, they, they have I think been very representative of some important issues that students want us to be aware of. They have challenged us uh, in very appropriate and effective ways. They have uh, certainly changed my thinking about a variety of issues, and I've been pleased to 
be engaged with them in that kind of dialogue because I think we've, we've uh, come to better outcomes than we would have if I were deciding things on my own or they were operating uh, independent uh, completely of the university administration. So I think it's a good collaborative uh, exchange with all of our student government organizations and I hope that continues. I, I certainly uh, want to also emphasize that despite the size of this place, and the need, as I said earlier, for us to rely upon representative student government, uh, sort of the way of the, the broader society too, uh, there are doors that are open to individual students. You know, I have lots of students who come to see me. I work with lots of colleagues whose doors are open to students who may not be representative of particular organizations, but bring their own personal needs, uh, aspirations, uh, and wishes to us for our consideration, and we're certainly open to doing that. Uh, I would let UPUA uh, respond if they if they have a, a view on that issue, and then uh, turn over the uh, the mic to someone else to talk about the faculty senate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and for those of you that don't know, my name is T.J. Barton, the current president of UPUA. Um, unfortunately, I have to respectfully disagree because the reason you as students have this opportunity tonight is because of the direct actions and hard work of weeks and weeks of, of representatives from UPUA, CCSG, and GSA. Um, we are working tirelessly and have been working tirelessly for the past three weeks to make sure that you as students have a voice in, in any decisions that are being made in the direction of this university. Um, we've held rallies, we've held speeches, we've done forums, and this is not going to be the end. This is only the beginning of what we foresee as being a long process. We always encourage more suggestions. We always encourage you reaching out to us because at the end of the day, we're here to serve you as a student body. And that's what we try to do to the best of our ability. And we've been very lucky to have a lot of input and a lot of feedback from the students um, and from the student body. And, and a lot of that feedback um, resulted in this forum today. And we encourage you to continue to reach out to us. Um, and obviously, our, our budget is not necessarily a token budget. Um, it is, it, it's given to us in order to implement um, such opportunities like this to the student body. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, my, my guess is, TJ, if you're, if you're looking for feedback, you'll get some from the second row here after tonight's event. In we have a question here. Hi, my name is Jalen Freeman Broadus. I'm a freshman in the College of Engineering. And I wanted to ask, um, okay, whenever a question arises concerning why certain people retain their positions and support, the answer is always that there's an ongoing investigation that still has to take place. Why was Coach Paterno not granted the same process if it's not because of the media? Hey, let me, let me also, can I just add to that, that I have about five people at the Commonwealth campus campuses asking that same question. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think I already uh, responded to that earlier, but uh, really what I'd like to do is to get people to look forward now. This, uh, you know, as a university, we need to be thinking about uh, all of these issues of, of how do we heal, how do we uh, deliver the message about what Penn State is really about. I mean, we, we have to remember what happened here. We have to learn from it but we also have to look ahead. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I hope our, our conversations uh, over the next uh, weeks uh, going forward will, will, will help drive those discussions about how does Penn State move forward and, and how does it do so in the best possible way. Question here. Hi, my name is Charles Coons and I'm a senior here. Uh, my question kind of is weird in that, don't you think it's kind of ironic that a certain university basketball coach gets a vote of confidence in the same situation almost, and our head coach gets thrown under the bus by the media and other people? Don't you think, especially Dean Foley, I'd like your opinion on this, uh, don't you find it kind of ironic in this whole integrity thing? Doesn't it, I mean, it kind of contradicts that, don't you think? Who was the basketball coach you were referring to at Syracuse? Well, you know, it's a difficult situation. And uh, certainly, we don't have all the answers to why everything that's been done was done. But people in leadership and the board of trustees were faced with a situation where they had to make some decisions. I, I can't second guess, second guess their decisions. You can, um, but, but I can't. 
I think they tried to do the best that they could under the circumstances. What they did, uh, someone asked, what, I think this gentleman in the front, the political scientist or crime law and justice guy, asked the question, well, you know, how come they didn't give him due process under the law? Well, Coach Paterno does have due process under the law, as does uh, everyone else who's involved in this. That's distinct from what happened here with the Board of Trustees, though. So when it comes to the question of integrity, no, I don't see a conflict of integrity there. I really don't. We could talk about it more later. You don't agree, I understand. But I do think integrity starts with all of us, all right, and asking ourselves every day what we do. And you know, we had a lot of questions about how we're going to restore integrity to Penn State. I think it's fair to say we'll do everything we can. My question back would be, what are you going to do? Question here. We, yeah, I, have, I have one in the back, actually. Can we go on this side? And by the way, we should add, we have uh, 10 minutes left for the television stream. And what we're going to do, we're going to do a closing to the event. But then we will keep going with the question and answer after that, if people would like. So, In moving forward, this spring semester is hot with the state appropriations, state budget coming out, and our tuition being announced. What is your specific plan or action plan when addressing the state legislature? Because we must recognize that these politicians are humans, not on this campus, and they're hearing the media. Of course, we have to get the message across, but more than that, what's your specific plan, and how do you, how, how do you plan on getting the students involved with that? And can you ensure, also, can you ensure that our tuition will not be infected at all by this scandal? Well, I'll be, uh, I'll be meeting with a number of uh, uh, elected representatives uh, over the course of the next uh, few weeks, uh, including the week after next. Uh, and uh, uh, my message to them uh, will continue to be the same message that Penn State has attempted to deliver for many years now, is uh, we're a, uh, a world-class research university that uh, has a tremendous impact uh, on Pennsylvania and the lives of a lot of Pennsylvanians. And uh, we're worthy of, of the Commonwealth's support. Uh, you know, I think none of us uh, are, are under the illusion that there's uh, a lot of uh, extra resources around there right now. So we have to also deliver the message that uh, what resources we get, we're going to continue to be good stewards of those resources, that we're going to use them to the best possible means. So my job will be to help uh, deliver that message, uh, along with the, uh, the other presidents of the other state-related universities. And um, we, will, uh, we will certainly be, uh, uh, as I say, on the one hand, delivering the, the message that, uh, uh, that Penn State is a good investment for the Commonwealth, uh, at the same time recognizing that, uh, the, that the state uh, doesn't have unlimited resources, in fact, uh, has, a, has a really serious situation with respect to the budget. I, I wanted so, to add something. You, you, you said, what would, could we do? Um, there is an initiative over the winter break which encourages students to meet their legislators. Those of you who are Pennsylvanians who go home, um, I would hope that this conversation would encourage you to talk with your legislators, talk to them personally about your own experience, your concerns, your worries um, for your future, or however else you wish to frame um, your discussion. But they want to hear from you. You are a constituent and a very strong constituent group. And uh, I, I think maybe some of the student leaders can give you more information about it. I'm very taken by this initiative. It is part of a, a grassroots initiative. I do hope you would consider it as a specific strategy for uh, reaching out to legislators. They do want to hear from the student perspective. Yeah, I would also add to that, whenever I get the chance through our, our government affairs uh, department, I'm, I go to Harrisburg and try to speak as carefully and as eloquently as I can about the benefits of Penn State to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And that includes all of the things we do, uh, including research and development uh, that have an effect on everything from national security to medicine. It's surprising to me how much impact that seems to have uh, when we have those discussions. It's surprising to me, or continues to be a surprise to me, 
that uh, so little is known about that aspect of Penn State. So we're doing everything we can, I think, from every perspective to try to make the arguments and to represent you and to represent the institution well. I love what Dr. Haynes said, though. I think that's a terrific idea because you're all, those of you who are 18 and over can vote. Uh, you are a constituency. Your parents are a constituency. You don't have to be militant, but it makes sense to be uh, engaged and active in the process to help us out. Okay, we are going to wind some things down here for this first part of the program, and then we can, we can keep going uh, with some questions as we go, but we do want to sign off on the television we're end, broadcast. We're going to end the formal part of the program now. Formal part. So John Lozano has some comments. Thank you very much. I know we've all appreciated you having, uh, having the both of you as our moderators here this evening. But most of all, I want to thank all of the students that were able to attend here tonight and all those who are watching online. I know that the last few weeks have been very trying for all of us, and events like this really help to give voice to those concerns and questions that we all have about everything that's been happening. I also want to thank all the administrators that took time out to be here this evening. I really think that an event like this and their presence here Helps to, give, helps to show that they directly want to interact and connect with students here at this university, include us in a big way going forward. So with that, I will hand it back to Sam and Lori for any final comments, and thank you all very much for being here tonight. So what we know is that conversation is a very difficult thing, and when it's just between two people. And when it's between hundreds of people, it's almost impossible. So I want to thank all of you who still have questions and who didn't get your full questions out or didn't give your full responses because there's so many of us here. I think this is really just a beginning. I'm hopeful that it's a beginning. I'm optimistic that it's a beginning because another thing that I, that I know about human relationships is that when conversation stops, rumors start, and darkness enters in. And so we really need to be talking to one another. Uh, and so my hope is that the students will push and will really demand that their voices are, are included in the decision-making process and that you all will be as open and welcoming to, to that process. Yeah, and what I'm hearing from you all is that maybe students don't have to push that much, that you really are asking for the comments and you're asking for the feedback. And I think that there's this kind of sense at a university that it's administrators and then it's faculty and then it's students and we're all fighting one another, but it doesn't seem like that so much. It seems like to a great degree we are on the same team. And so maybe one positive thing that comes out of this is that it's a, very, it's a new opportunity to have a collective conversation. Um, that we haven't had for a long time. So I've been here for 21 years, and this is a very unique experience for me, and I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation well into the future. And, so, and what I'm hoping is that our next conversation uh, is the conversation where we start to ask ourselves some difficult questions and ask ourselves as, as a community, what are we going to do differently, and what do we need to do differently, and how, how does this culture need to change? I think that's an important place to go forward. Yes, because I had a lot of questions coming in about things like State Patty's Day and putting it kind of back onto the students to say, what are you really going to do? Let's not just look up there. Let's also hold the mirror up to ourselves. So thank you all. Thank you. And, and once again, are, if we, if you're going to leave, why don't you? Tonight's Penn State Town Hall Forum has been organized and presented by three Penn State student organizations, University Park Undergraduate Association, the Council of Commonwealth Student Governments, and the Graduate Student Association. Good night from Penn State's University Park campus.